Who is Kragus the Crabfeeder, sadistic Prince Admiral of Mir, and major antagonist of House of the Dragon, explored? Now that we've had time to digest two episodes of House of the Dragon, we can finally get around to talking about which characters have what alignments. So far, Otto Hightower has emerged as the chaotic evil of the show and is clearly the biggest cerebral antagonist that House Targaryen has amongst its ranks. Lord Corlys Valerium and Prince Daemon Targaryen have been flirting with both sides, but we mostly like them because they're so damn charming and charismatic. And King Viserys is the purest, most simple man in the show so far, which is actually saying something considering the consolidated legacy of Targaryen kings. But the one man that has been standing out to us from all the promotional material is a certain gold mass maniac who reminds us a lot of another Viserys from a different era. The man's name is Kragus Drahar, but men call him the Crab Feeder for his inventive methods of punishment. But who is this guy? Why does he look so damn scary? Where is he from? And what are his goals? We're going to answer all those questions and more in this video as we attempt to find out who is Kragus the Crab Feeder. And before you go any further, this is your spoiler warning for House of the Dragon Episode 2, because there are going to be a lot of those. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Crab Feeder is backed by powerful entities within the Free Cities who wish to see Westeros weakened. Where does the Crab Feeder come from, and why is it important? Kragus Drahar is described in Fire and Blood as a Prince Admiral of Myr. The Free City of Myr has a particularly strained recent history with House Targaryen in terms of where the timeline lies in House of the Dragon, and we're going to get into that in a minute. First, time for a history lesson. Thousands of years ago, after Valyria defeated the old Giscari Empire and conquered their lands, they turned their eyes westward and looked to claim the entire western half of Essos for their own. Their fire and blood based war tactics managed to make the Rhoynar leave their beloved mother after 250 years of war, and the sheer power that the dragons of Valyria projected was enough to cause the Andals to invade Westeros and make it their new permanent home. But apparently, they didn't make the shift quick enough, because the Freehold managed to conquer at least one walled Andal town before the latter's departure from Essos, and that town would come to be known as the Free City of Myr. Now, we know you're wondering why it is Myr called a Free City when it was conquered by Valyria. Well, it's all about the details. See, what the Valyrians had built was practically an empire, but technically a freehold, where all decisions were made by landholding members of a greater council of 40 families. But the free cities were more like outposts established to promote trade and commerce whilst displaying Valyria's strength, and, in the case of Lys, acting as a pleasure retreat for dragon lords. Myr was founded as a trading colony by the Valyrians, and was not under the direct jurisdiction of the dragon lords instead being governed by its own citizens, thus gaining the moniker of a free city. After the doom fell upon Valyria, Myr ended up becoming the foremost authority in the world on finished goods. Fabrics from Myr such as lace, velvet, and others are coveted in the known world for their intricacy and impeccable quality. The Myrish were also responsible for creating glassware unlike any other in all the realms, and were one of the only people known to have made lenses accurate enough to give scholars an unfiltered look into the heavens, which is a very fancy way of saying that they made telescopes for the scientists of George R. R. Martin's world. Following the fall of Valyria, Myr has been ruled by a conclave of magisters, which is basically a council of the richest and noblest citizens of Myr. It has also continued the tradition of slavery, and it is said that for every free man in Myr, there are three slaves. And when it comes to relations with the Iron Throne in recent years, Myr has been a free city that has been especially belligerent. During the reign of King Jaehaerys, Prince Morian Martell launched the Fourth Dornish War in 83 AC by invading Cape Wrath in the Stormlands. His ships were crewed by Myrish cell sails, amongst others, and they all died to a man thanks to the fiery breaths of Vermithor, Vagar, and Caraxes. Then, nearly a decade later, a civil war broke out in Myr, which caused the losing faction to flee to the Stepstones. After getting routed there by the Archon of Tyrosh, these Myr men landed on the Isle of Tarth and quickly captured half of it. The Iron Throne responded by dispatching the Valerian fleet and Prince Aemon Targaryen to the front lines, but the Myrish crossbowmen ended up killing King Jaehaerys' heir with an errant bolt and plunged the Seven Kingdoms into a succession crisis they never truly recovered 
recovered from. Aemon was avenged by his brother Balon when he burnt all the ships of the Exiles and slew their leader with Dark Sister, but the damage to House Targaryen had already been done. Because of Aemon's passing, the matter of succession became a debate, as Aemon's eldest daughter Rhaenys was passed over in favor of Jaehaerys' eldest male descendant Balon, putting into motion events that would lead to the Great Council of 101 AC. As for why Myrrha is now looking to anger the Iron Throne, that matter too lies in the Stepstones and the ownership of it, or the perceived ownership of it. My lords, the growing alliance among the free cities has taken to styling itself the Triarchy. A brief introduction to the Triarchy. Since the very first small council scene, we've been hearing about the Triarchy, an eternal alliance between three major free cities. Those three cities are Lys, Myr, and Tyrosh, and they came together in 96 AC after defeating Valantine forces attempting to conquer the disputed lands. This triumvirate, when combined, controls the entire southwestern coastline of Essos, and after defeating the eldest daughter of Valyria, they attempted to extend this monopoly to the Stepstones. Now, from a resource perspective, this group of islands in the Narrow Sea is worthless, but from a strategic standpoint, the Stepstones are priceless. They are the only trade route between the west and the east, if you're planning to go anywhere beyond Mir, that is, and a major chunk of the known world's naval trade passes through the Stepstones. So, securing the Stepstones can give any side a huge political advantage, as they would effectively be able to control world trade at an unprecedented scale. And we have to imagine that it is for this reason that the Triarchy's first action after becoming a thing was to invade the Stepstones and clear it of any pirate presence, claiming it for their own. If you want to know more about the Triarchy, let us know in the comments and we will make a separate video on them. But for now, what you need to know about how they relate to Kragus the Crabfeeder is that he is the leader of the this organization in all but name. Who is Kregis Drahar, aka the Crab Feeder? So, remember the Myra Civil War we spoke about a few moments ago? The losing side was completely eradicated by Prince Balon, Vagar, and their allies. But what happened to the side that won? Well, simple logic would dictate that that side went on to establish the Triarchy with Tyrosh and Lys, and if we are correct about his stature, then Kregas Drahar was at the center of the action from the side of the Free Cities. As we've told you already in Mir, the decisions are made by a conclave of magisters, which is comprised of the city's wealthiest and noblest citizens and families. The Drahar family name is one that keeps reappearing in the annals of the East, so it is safe to say that Kregas is a descendant of the Myra Irish royalty. Kregas' side ended up winning the Myrish bloodbath, which was described as being extraordinarily violent by all accounts, and then creating an alliance with Lees and Tyrosh to share power amongst the three cities in exchange for total naval dominance of trade to and from the Narrow Sea and Summer Sea. The aforementioned invasion of the Stepstones was also led by Kregas Drahar, who was named Prince Admiral of the Triarchy presumably because he was the naval commander of the Alliance and one of its foremost figureheads. In Fire and Blood, we are told that Kregas earned his nickname Crabfeeder by ruthlessly feeding the pirates he had defeated at the Stepstones to the Waves or the Crabs, whichever came first. He would go on to establish the area as Triarchy territory and create a toll for passing ships, which was paid gladly by the Westerosi in the beginning. But as the years progressed, the tolls increased exorbitantly, and after a decade of controlling the Stepstones, the Triarchy was imposing such high tolls and tariffs that it was directly affecting trade in Westeros. Things reached a boiling point, and Lord Corlys Valerian, who had relinquished his seat on the small council half a decade prior, launched a private war to conquer the Stepstones alongside his dragon-riding ally, Daemon Targaryen. For two years, Daemon and Corlys battled the Crabfeeder's forces, and finally, in 109 AC, Daemon managed to strike off his enemy's head and claimed his kingdom. Thus ended the life of Kragus the Crabfeeder, Prince Admiral of the Triarchy, and Lord of the Stepstones. But House of the Dragon is taking a far more sinister approach with him. Kragus the Crabfeeder in House of the Dragon House of the Dragon has already shown us that they are not shy of filling in the massive blanks left behind intentionally, we might add, by the author of Fire and Blood, Archmaester Gildane, and it appears that they have taken more than a bit of creative license when it comes to the Crabfeeder. For starters, let's talk about the political situation. Since the timeline of House of the Dragon is truncated for storytelling and legal purposes, the Crabfeeder is ignored by the small council for over a year. 
This matches what happened in the books, in that Viserys' advisors were more than happy to pay the toll as long as pirates were kept out of the Stepstones, apparently unaware of the weakness it was projecting to the rest of the known world. In the TV show, this concept is given much more weight in order to make us realize that even though Viserys' reign has been peaceful when isolated from everything else, his weakness will be the cause for the downfall of the dragons. And to add on to that, Kragas is blatantly shown nailing Valerian sailors to posts, which is a direct attack on the men of the Master of Ships of the Iron Throne, and is just as good as declaring hostile intentions towards the Seven Kingdoms. What is so different is Kragas himself, because he looks nothing like what you would expect a Prince Admiral of the Free Cities to look like. In George R. R. Martin's books, most people from the Free Cities wear absurdly rich clothing as a means to express their status, given that most Free Cities also practice slavery. And isn't that the mother of all ironies? But one look at Daniel Scott Smith's Kragas will tell you that this guy is not the one any of the book fans were expecting to see. For starters, he wears a grossly misshapen mask made out of molten gold, which kind of reminds us of Viserys Targaryen, Danny's brother, and his golden crown. <laughs> when we saw it in the trailers, we thought the mask was created because of gold that stuck to Kragas' face as he suffered burns, which is a sentence we struggled to articulate, dear viewers, but a closer look at the stills tells a far more disturbing story. If you take a close look at the crab feeder's skin, you'll see that his blood appears to have been boiled from the inside out with grayscale like protrusions all across his torso. Yep, it appears as though the crab feeder isn't just a ruthless naval captain, he is also a certified lunatic because grayscale, the disease he seems to be suffering from, causes progressive degeneration of the afflicted person's mental faculties, which means that while his post nailing crab feeding thing might have started out as a brute form of justice, it has definitely devolved into a sadistic pastime for him thanks to the fact he is literally losing his mind. This also explains why he wears a mask, but it doesn't explain why he's still in command of the Triarchy's fleet. Grayscale is a notoriously contagious ailment and spreads through touch. The crab feeder has never even attempted to hide his grayscale in any of the promo footage we have seen so far, so it is possible that those are just severe burn marks on him, but we think there is more to it than that. Regardless of whether he has grayscale or not, the one thing that we can confirm is that he is going to be facing off against our favorite rogue prince in the next episode. Episode 3 is allegedly going to be set 4 years after Episode 2, and by that time, Daemon should have easily conquered the Stepstones and established his own kingdom. As a character, Kragas Drahar carries strong echoes of some of the more obscure elements of mostly lost culture of the Roynard whose descendants now populate the Sands of Dorne. It is said that the native population of Myr is of Roynish stock because of the fact that they have similar olive skin and dark hair, and it looks like House of the Dragon is giving us soft confirmation on that via Kragas and his moniker. In ancient Roynish texts, tales are told of an evil crab king who fights with the old man of the river for dominion over all life under the sea. Now, we don't want to make things too obvious, but just think about everything we told you about Kragas and now picture him as a crab king. This isn't a description that is too far off the mark, and what makes the Roynish connection even deeper, peculiarly enough, is the fact that Kragas seems to have grayscale. Grayscale is a disease that is closely associated with the fall of the Roynar, with some even calling it Garen's Curse after the Valyrians drove the Roynar out of their settlements near the Rhoyne. In A Dance with the Dragons, Tyrion Lannister almost drowns in the sorrows, the place where Garen's curse is said to be at its most potent, and is literally a breath away from contracting Grayscale himself before he is saved by young Griff's companions. So it is possible that with Kragas Crab Feeder, Ryan and Miguel are trying to make a cultural depth of House of the Dragon feel even deeper. And to be honest with you, it would make a ton of sense if Kragas vs. Daemon turned into a Roinar vs. Valyrian conflict, because much like George R. R. Martin's writings, the creators of the show have also seemed to have adopted the archetypal approach to storytelling, where multiple characters do or say things that an archetype has already been set up to do or say by Martin earlier. And the last major difference between Kragas from Fire and Blood and Kragas from House of the Dragon is definitely his proclivity for violence. 
In the former, it was said that the reason for Lord Corliss' private war on the Stepstones was the exorbitant tax rates imposed by the Triarchy, whereas in the latter, it is clearly said that the Crab Feeder attacked one of the Sea Snake's ships and killed all his men. House of the Dragon has made it clear that they are not going to shy away from making things personal, so it will be very interesting to see how they treat Craig Estrahar in his story, because he might not be a major character or be overtly important to the plot, but he is one of the most intriguing villains that the Game of Thrones universe has given us since Ramsay Bolton, and we cannot wait to see how things play out with him in the future episodes of Season 1, even though we know his eventual fate. Marvelous Verdict House of the Dragon is not going to be a show where finding characters to root for is going to be easy. But having said that, finding someone to absolutely despise seems to not be a problem at all, because we already hate Kragus the Crab Feeder, and he hasn't even spoken a word yet. He looks and feels almost like a cult leader whose language is pure maritime violence and whose men follow him blindly even after knowing full well that he's carrying a potentially deadly disease that can render them all crazy. Prince Admiral Drahar is arguably one of the better quiet villains in the Game of Thrones franchise, and definitely one of the best villains overall considering what their idea of a bad guy became towards the final two episodes of the first series. Luckily for us, House of the Dragon seems dead set on righting those wrongs, and here's hoping that the Crab Feeder is but one of many. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. And the King's failures have allowed him to accumulate strength.